Uh, well, good evening, or uh, late afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Hitchin, I'm the leader of Presbytery Council. Um, those people who have made the presentations uh, this evening, there are some new faces on the block as well. Uh, we hopefully um, this will be an open session. Um, but there are lots of opportunities, there are lots of plans which we have for Herefordshire. Uh, but it, it, to be honest, it doesn't feel very positive at the moment. I think for business people, things are very, very tough. Uh, energy prices going up, COVID, uh, we don't know quite how bad it is, but lots of people on, on the shop, sort of shop floor who are, who are ill, um, can't pay what they need. So lots of pressures. And it's the same actually for the council, there are lots of pressures for us too. And one of the weird things about the council is that we set our budget for, for, for the year from, uh, it's called municipal year, from uh, March to April. And, and we start talking about it in the last, sort of last, you know, long term, long term time. So, we, so we, we have to produce a balanced budget, so we're not allowed to, not people are not uh, allowed to make a lot. So, come last October, November, we just start talking start talk about it, um, what the budget would look like. And now, it, and it looks quite, quite scary. This inflation is at 8%. Fuel prices are going up. But we, set, we set our budget a long time ago. And things are, are in, it's not going to be a difficult year for a new in business. It's not going to be very easy uh, for us uh, in the council either. Um, and as I say, we have to have a balanced budget. We can't make a lot of time. So we're going to have to be working hard to deliver all the services that you pay up. So I'm sorry to start a bit miserable, but actually we had a business call meeting. We had a business call meeting yesterday, and there were two speakers there saying, you know, I'd like to give you some good news, but I don't have any. So, <laughs> so, so we're going to give you some good news. We're going to be really positive. And the first on the stage is actually you can say the call. Well, no pressure then in terms of good news. Um, I think the first bit of good news is that it probably shows how lucky this is the KC Martin and the uh, enterprise law, which has been the development of the Advanced Timber Manufacturing Centre. <coughs> July, one was saying, completion, students, James, sorry, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, sorry, I just said, July opening, James, students in September. Yes, students in September. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Uh, it was completely unrehearsed. <laughs> No, and well, that's fantastic to see, and that's a really good piece of development. Um, there's only one other advanced timber manufacturing centre in the country, Sheffield, is it? Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Uh, but now, good progress. Yes, good and positive. And it's good and positive to see so many faces again tonight. Um, really do a lot of the work that we've been doing so far. So, what have we got plans for tonight? <coughs> Um, so in focus presentation to meet some new people. Uh, Pastor Chan is going to take us through the green, green footprint presentation and how business can get involved, what that means for business, and bring that to life for us. Um, Ross Cook, our uh, newly joined corporate director of the economy and environment, is going to take us through the local plan where we're up to, what the time scale is for completion to get them ready for public consultation. How we engage and what that looks like. The Herefordshire Hereford Master Plan with David Obaka is going to take us through what we call the Hereford City Centre Strategy. That's the set a few times in, in the research I did to come to my interview. And like all the candidates went on the website looking for the economic strategy, looking for the city centre strategy. There were some old documents there that you can be refreshed if you do. What David's going to take us through tonight is a weekly set of ambitious. Uh, principles that we want to achieve through the city centre strategy, what that looks like in terms of the place, the transport, what does this thing called an active travel city look like? What's that thing around place making? How do we bring it to life? And then ultimately, how do we get the message out and tell a better story about the city? Bring it to life for people. What does that mean? The big economic plan, Roger's going to take us where we're up to with that. And I've been really pleased with how that's been received so far. 
wherever we go and talk about the 2050 economic big plan, we get a warm reception. Uh, people are pleased to see there's an ambition and a vision going forward. So I think fundamentally for me, I'm always keen to say it is this isn't the council's strategy or the council's plan. It's the council starting a conversation with people about what the council's economy might look like by 2050 and how do we all play our part. Roger's well, going to talk to us about how we do that, you know, that call to action to bring people together and to start that discussion bring the group together, start having that conversation about the big disruptive ideas, as I said, that's going to bring this to life. And again, we've got a time time scale. We want to bring some healthy momentum and pace to that work. So by the end of the calendar now in December, we've got an outline 2050 big plan to talk to more people about, um, not just business people, community and voluntary sector, the wider public service, but ultimately, we want to take this out to the good form of caricature. Stand up and be counted about what that thing is in that goal plan. But just as the council, we'll just do that together with the board. That's new territory, new space for us to move into. But that's the ambition that Roger's going to talk to us about how we get there. And then, if Jesse was here, it'd be on wage and, and everything talking about levelling up. It'd be fantastic. It's going to solve all our problems. It's going to be extremely helpful. I'm just going to talk about what well, moving from a priority two um, area to a priority one means to us. Yes, we get some extra cash to help develop the dish. Um, you know, the amounts of money that's available are still the same in terms of two up to 20 million and a bit for the transport authority. But it's how we've developed that thinking of that bit. So I don't, or we don't have to go to um, Jesse or Bill and say, please don't use your veto. So we engage them early in the conversation and take them with us. And then as ever, the feedback we've had so far is that we'll leave some real good time for questions so that people who see your issue. You come out tonight to listen, but we also want to give the opportunity to ask your questions. We've had some in advance so we can practice the answers. But I'm sure there'll be some that come from the floor that uh, will test us and challenge us and quite right. And um, for me, going through the work we've done so far about engaging with you, being more open and transparent about what we're doing, has been one of the standout issues in all the conversations we've had, whether it's been through the Economic Summit in September, our first quarterly update at the start of the year, or the round of the visits that we've done to each one of the market towns to share our thinking around the economy, but also to listen to people within the local market towns about what's important for them. Um, and one of the great ideas that came from it, I think it was Ledbury, was, you know, can you just talk to us on a regular basis and once a month do a blog, write out and tell us what's happening with all the schemes and initiatives. Um, so that's what we did it, did it for the first time, got some really good feedback. So we're going to keep doing that and shaping it, just letting people know what's happening, when it's happening, and how people can get involved. So improving that communication is really, really important. I remember standing up here in September to be, you know, warmly welcomed, but clear message coming back from the audience that about time we found out what was going on, and that's what we're trying to get better at. So we've got our second quarterly meeting tonight, and then we've got further meetings planned into July and October, and the next round of market town meetings, where we'll be taking the presentation out to the market towns, and having a similar conversation very much at the local level on set out there. The other standout issue for us around the planning service. It's still a standout issue for us because there's still challenges and problems. The problem we had at the time was the backlog of all 400 applications that just not being dealt with. That's now down to 87 as of five o'clock this evening. All right, it's not like anything either. It's a lot of <laughs> <laughs> idea. But pleased with that, pleased that we've made progress with it. And it shows that we can make progress. The first one to recognise we've still got problems with our with planning and support we have from other agencies. George reminded me before that we've still got problems with some of some applications, and you will have similar issues. So it's not perfect by a long way, but it's on the move. And if you know any colleagues who are looking for work <laughs> in Herefordshire, please send it my way, and I will happily have a conversation. Um, so, yes, to do, 
got some good stories to tell tonight about where we're heading and where we go from here. And on that note, I shall hand it over to Councillor Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. There we go. Uh, we've got a lot to get through tonight, so I will be as quick as possible so we can move on with all of the other speakers as well. Um, I'm here just to talk to you about the interface between the two parts of my portfolio. So I'm cabinet member for environment and economy. Those are not in contradiction, they're not in tension. They have to work together. There is a massive overlapping Venn diagram between those two. And the Green Footprints campaign is something that is highly relevant to what we're doing as a council to support the economy and to what we'd like to invite the business sector to get involved with um, as well. I got you on the next slide. Okay, so since we, we were last here in September, weren't we? So since we were last here, we've had COP26, I think we go. You know, we've had a lot of messaging from central government emphasising the importance of green growth. We had yet another report from the IPCC yesterday highlighting the urgency of tackling the climate challenge. And we've been doing stuff in Herefordshire as well. So we set up Herefordshire Climate and Nature Partnership Board. It's got 16 members from four different kinds of sectors of society, including business, with the aim of identifying how we can work together to tackle the climate crisis and to meet our ambitions of being a zero carbon county, as well as a zero carbon council. By 2030, and that's fully in line with what the, what the central government also uh, wants us to do. There's information there; it's very tiny, right? You don't try and read for that, but it's on our website. So if you search zero carbon heritage, you'll find the website. If you search greenerfootprints.co.uk, you will find the Greener Footprints campaign, which is one of the initiatives that this board is spearheading. Um, now. On that website that I just mentioned, we've got an action plan for how we can help her ship to transition to zero carbon. And it's got those three sections uh, that we're talking about there. Back in January, our council facilitated a citizens climate assembly, which is another initiative to try to engage the population generally with this agenda, but also to identify what we need to do. And we worked with expert organisations to select 48 months to across the region, representing all demographics, accurately weighted according to our population, in order to have a representative sample to engage with the three main themes highlighted there that are the core part of our carbon footprint in Hertfordshire. So that's buildings, transport, and food, farming, and land use. Each of those areas has got subgroups underneath the, the partnership board. Each of those areas were looked at in detail by the Climate Assembly, which came up with a whole bunch of recommendations as to what we should do. You can find that information on the website too. But what was so, so striking about that was that the vast majority of the recommendations they came up with and then voted on themselves had 80 to 95% strong support from the members of that Climate Assembly. And that just highlights how important this agenda is for citizens, for customers, and hopefully also for yourselves as, as business leaders as well. Now, I mentioned that the board is kind of spearheading this Greener Footprints campaign. It was launched back in late January. You might have seen some of the publicity in the Times and other areas like that. What we're asking people to do is really very simple, to sign up to make a pledge to take steps to reduce the carbon footprint and the ecological footprint of what you do as an individual, as an organisation, or as a business. And if there's one thing that you take away from here today, I hope that you make a commitment to go home, to click on that link, Greener Footprint, and to sign up to take that pledge for yourselves as a business. Can I just ask, actually, while we're here, how many of your businesses are measuring your that's fantastic, absolutely brilliant, good on you, fabulous. Hopefully when we're back in six months' time, we'll have double the number, triple the number of people um, saying that. Now, what we're trying to do here is to mobilise the whole of the Herefordshire population, whether it's individuals with suggestions about 
things that they can do to get that they can take their own lifestyles, or indeed businesses. And we will is the fact it's there 30 for 2030. This is one of the latest initiatives that's just been launched. Trying to pull together a kind of cohort of 30 businesses and other organizations that are committed to taking those steps to reduce carbon footprint and to kind of publicizing what they're doing, to sharing their journeys. So our communication support team will be providing support to those companies and advice helping to connect you. We're still looking for additional organisations to take part in that. So if your company would be interested in participating, please do get in touch. Drop me a line, nag me to say if you can, mention it to any of the council staff that we've got here. Because that journey to zero carbon, you know, it, it's a necessity. It's something that we have to do, right? It's something that we can help inspire each other to do by sharing the journey. And it's something that Doing together will make it easier because we can learn from each other. Businesses can learn from each other. As a council, we would like to learn from businesses what we can do to help make your zero cost journey easy as well. And that just identifies some of the um, partners in the 2030 for 2030 campaign that we're already engaged. I'm going to stop there. Really happy to answer questions at the end. But like I say, if you take one thing away from this, Please do look for greenerfootprints.co.uk. Sign up to make that pledge yourselves. So crucially, your businesses. You have immense reach in the community, whether it's talking to your suppliers, your customers, some of you may be public facing businesses who have an incredible opportunity to actually share this agenda with the people that you need to contact on a daily basis for your business. So please do think about how you can help to model that journey yourselves and also share that experience with others. Because if the current energy price crisis has taught us anything, it has taught us that these agendas go hand in hand. That overlap is so strong. We know that we need to do energy efficiency because we've got to reduce our carbon footprint. We've also got to do energy efficiency because it makes simple financial sense. We know we need to invest in renewables because it's necessary to reduce our carbon. We also know it's the cheapest way to generate and use energy. So hopefully you will all please join in with that Greener Footprints campaign and think about how you can spread the word to your suppliers and your customers. Thank you. I'm going to pass on to oh sorry I had an extra slide. There you go. I'm a two expert player. Thank you, Chair. So, good evening, everybody. I'm Ross Cook, as it says, um, also Corporate Director for uh, Economy and Environment. Um, I'm on week eight here at Pembrokeshire, so uh, still trying to beat many of you, probably from Met quite a few of you already. Um, and as you can imagine, I mean, I was in a similar position before, actually, when I gave my interview back in November, looking at the key documents, trying to understand the county and how it operates. And, have supported this um, and struggling to find those documents actually made me want to come even more, want to be involved in actually helping shape the growth of the county, uh, supporting and working with businesses to actually bring those key strategies and policies together so that actually we can set out the, the framework for you. So it's really a really good time for me to join them. Very well. Um, but also the part of that, as you'd imagine, the, the economy environment uh, portfolio that I look after works with so many of the services that you, you probably deal with on a daily basis or on a regular basis, um, particularly supporting businesses, whether it's through planning, licensing, training standards, um, whether it's through the maintenance of our highways, all those sort of key frontline services that are the crucial to keep your businesses operating. But also with Roger and the team, supporting businesses around growth and skills. And I think seeing the, the place where we are now with the, the economic plan, which Roger will talk about later on, We'll talk about that movement for growth and how we actually support businesses around the city and county. But actually, this key document around the local plan, how we allocate land as we go forward, all three of these those documents need to work together. We need to see where the areas of growth will be. We want to talk to you and understand where you think your growth will be or new opportunities, not just for both purposes of growth and business, but for housing. We need to see if you're bringing in um, more growth where people want to live, what the 
multicultural offer, how do we support that uh, Indian economy? All of those key things have to go together. So it's not just about um, you know, the, the sort of nuts and bolts thing, it's a whole other overarching document. So the local plan we do, we started consulting on that uh, at the end of last year. Um, we've had really good responses so far. We're just about to go out on the second phase of that, going out on the policy documents. Um, and to really focus on some of those opportunities to, to see where, particularly where education allocations, there's some difficult and some interesting questions there around where we see the growth. Is it split across the whole county around the market zones? Is it a few market zone? What are the options there? We really want to understand the viewers and businesses what that means to you. Um, we've given this presentation to, to colleagues in, in academia as well, and we're really, really keen to talk to young people. So we're talking about 2050 vision here, which Probably what we work working then for might be depending on the, the cost of living. Um, but we want to know what people think, you know, what young people think, what will keep them in the county, what will bring them into study, what, why will they stay here, go for employment, set up their own businesses, all of those things, the cost of living in the county. So we really want to get out there and have a meaningful conversation with young people, as I said, to really shape all this together. So David will talk about the master plan, Roger will talk about the economic plan, the local plan, and it's not a good one. Works. All three of these will be adopted by council early next year because they have to go together. We need to make sure that they are using the same data sets, the same narrative. We've all got the same vision for where we want to be. And so this is again is a really part, really important part of that conversation and engagement with you. And before said, we're really keen to, to hear from your comments and any questions later on. Okay. <laughs> Just one day. Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for listening to us today. Right, okay. So it is what it's on the screen. Um, but that's the that's the strap line. Um, I'll board it because I am a professional place maker, professional city maker. I had the great privilege of playing with London for a decade. Um, I was very well known son of Peter Barrow and Lionel Barrow. Um, so why Hereford? Um, I've got the history buff. And when you get to play with a place that probably aren't established, um, which is the first very long time ago, you can't really pass that up. But <laughs> when I came to Hereford for, for the first time, I would come at day 49, and I couldn't understand why my car was saying it would take another hour and a half to get to Cloud Lane. <laughs> from where the outskirts of London had got to London, London here at just over three. I was like, well, okay, I'm there. But it then took me an hour and 45 minutes to get to that one. So it's really about taking up part of that green agenda. How do we make Harrogate a place? Making it cleaner, greener, and healthier place for our children. It's for us as well. A lot of this will be in the short to medium term, but a lot of it will take a long time to do. What we're here to do, though, is to actually talk to you about how it happens. This isn't something that's going to be happening in isolation, but we're making sure that we do it. This is how. So there's a transport component to it. Um, we need to deal with resilience to the highway network. The highway network at the moment, you've got a bridge. And again, I told me it was the new bridge. And coming from an engineering background, and I went and architecture, I was looking for the new bridge. And then I realized I stopped. And, and he has not got out and thought, if that's the new bridge, we've got a problem. Because that's at least a 1966 bridge, which they is 1960s bridge. So and it's concrete. So that's going to need significant <coughs> uh, work in the near future to make it proper. And that's going to reduce the resilience in your cities. Could do nothing for her. At AM and PM, people are traveling to Winnipeg. Can you imagine when the national highways need to do really major work to that bridge? So from a resilience point of view, we want to look at the Eastern Bridge and build resilience into this network. It will have other benefits as well. But my key priority is. How do we make sure that we build resilience into the network? My one of my passions more than science. And although some great work has been done by um, members over the last few years in trying to pull Hereford towards that, what I do and what I've done to other cities is a lot more around it. It's making that safe and that site and offer actually safe. Making people want to dwell in towns and cities so that their spend goes way up because they want to they're coming from one place. That's Purpose, but because they're staying longer, they spend more businesses. 
So when we look at that, and I'm overstating an awful lot of our existing projects, like the transport hub, to make sure as they are ongoing, a lot of the city centre projects happening now, that they're in line with the vision that we're trying to do. So this, this isn't something that's uh, way up to be adopted next year, but very much in the ground now and making sure we're doing it. To do both of those, we need to have complementary beds, and that might cause a bit of concern and a pain in this world here, but we're going to have to trust that in the long run, this is going to be good for everybody. And it means looking at the car park strategy. The pain is saying, how have I walked into one of the oldest cities in this country? And every time I turn the corner in the central core, I see another car park. I mean, I've never seen so many car parks in my life. So we need to think about how we can drive into this system. I'm not saying we'll stop you driving, in, but we're going to give you more choice in terms of where you can walk, cycle. And another one of the priorities I've been given to reinvent your bus service. So it's not an open bus service, but it's much more of a rural model. With that, when you sort out movement patterns in the city, and that's one of the things that's the great up this condition or river service in the I can't think of those. I've had some really good conversations with Network Rail, had some really good conversations with National Highways, and we're talking to the Canal Trust in the centre. And I think there's a, there is huge potential in your river to actually bring an even more economic benefit to the city. It's like a great undiscovered country. You have one of the greatest rivers in the, in, in the UK, and yet, for some reason, the city's almost left its back. So we look at some maybe new sites that have to be done to But that goes to place making, because when you reinvent your, reintroduce these like river, reduce the proliferating car parks and rationalise them to one or two bigger places, you get these spaces left to what we do with these spaces. I don't think we should develop a new model. I don't think we may need to break places where people work in the city and we're going to introduce living in the city as well and can't eat. Come and relax and come and talk to people. So it's not just high town. We want to create a proper public rail strategy of new grey, new green spaces that are dispersed around the city and the city core to make sure Hereford Green regreens itself and becomes a nice place to be both people and business. To do that, we really need to have the sort of stuff which our strategic partners are looking at, and that's why I'm a strategy director. So if you're going to talk to national highways, you have to have those data sets which Ross alluded to that are up to date about what they're looking for. So when you go and have conversations with them, you're all on the same page and things actually get moved. We're having really good conversations with them, and they've actually offered us their visit model to actually build our visit model. That, that was a lot they made last week. Is that they need to engage with us and make sure that the 849 that they're responsible for adds to the, the changes that Eric is trying to make. But there are other things that we need to do, and the key one to that, and again, it was alluded to earlier, for me, yes, we can make these changes, but we should make it in isolation. So the first consultant I've been trying to take on the internet is our Mark Hans consultant, who will be specifically making sure we get engaged with sessions with you. Other stakeholders so people can continuously engage in the process of development. <laughs> That's just an idea of this. I'm, I'm not here forever, I'm literally here for a year. I've got to do this very quickly. To do it, I need specialists in place that cover things like CEO, you know, town planning, architecture, cycle excellence, all of those things, environment, sustainability. We can literally, as the council upskills itself in terms of officers, this organisation will be creating. With me, a foundation that will stay for a very long time and be relevant to all the work that goes on to the future. That's what we're here to do. Timeline wise, we mentioned that as we were beginning, we're going to run through um, various studies. And one of the things I've emphasized to all the consultants and to fellow um, staff and councils that I won't be doing that to the there's been some great work, some of the things I've noted, so as much as possible, we'll be making sure that we start with more focus and build on what's there. It needs to be done from scratch, we'll do it from scratch. The lease of the project is a vision and design, and again, we'll be, we don't want to overload you. So, what, again, what Russ was saying, we've got these really good studies, but we have to really coordinate ourselves so that when we're coming back to you, we're not overloading you with all of these things separately. How can we make sure we're getting that message out at the same time? And, and you are not getting sort of consultation that can now be a skill that's on us to make sure we get right. Um, by November, we'll literally be crossing T's and dotting I's on this. That's how fast we have to move. 
but again, I believe I'm really in the field and I'm going to soon start this salt to get this done. We'll be grounding a hog for um for our members of the cabinet and the next year. That's just a quick structure, that's where we sit the organization. You're there on, on that side, so it's double stakeholders. So you are represented, you're really forced to this ongoing conversation. And I think that's it. <coughs> Yeah, so, be quite uh, quick on the uh, on the economic facts. You've lots of you have heard it before, maybe the room of both of us test this before. Uh, so, uh, I just really give a bit of an update on what we're doing next. And the time to get to some questions and answers. Uh, but, uh, I know that uh, you'll be continuing to talk about some things that you've heard today. Transport's obviously been a huge thing for the for the city and the council for a long, uh, long time. So, expect anyone to take it uh, leading on. Uh, so, just a, just a very brief refresher to so why we're doing an economic. Uh, strategy while we're doing an economic plan uh, right now. Well, so alongside looking at the, the local plan that Ross mentioned, so what where, what are the land uses of the county? What do we need? Where do we need employment land? Where do we need housing? Uh, how are we going to help the economy grow? How are we going to address those big long term economic challenges we have as a county? We need to plan that kind of guides that we need, we need you to tell us for your businesses how can we help you grow? What are the things that you need to see? Where are the problems around skills? Employment land and facilities. How do we create a plan and a vision to address those things long term? Our current vision, we do have one, but it's quite dated. It's uh, 2018. It mentions the bypass. It was pre-COVID, uh, so we need we need a new plan to do that. But I think what's probably just as important is we need a plan that gives you confidence to invest in the county for your business and for the businesses to invest here. We we hear all the time that's and that this is that we. Confidence is king for the private sector in terms of the things that you do, the planning that you can make for the future. We need to give you confidence that we're investing in the county and that we've got a plan for the future of the county uh, around that. Uh, and then uh, finally, really kind of covers the last few slides, but the last things on the slide will cover this a bit more later. Um, we need to be in a good place to access some of that government funding. You know, what government likes to see is a long term vision of the plan and then understand how we, how we can then uh, make cases for the, for the funding for that. Uh, what we'll going to the challenges too much discussions of time, uh, but you've heard them before. We've got low uh, average, our, our, our weekly wage is 20% below the national average, but the lowest uh, county uh, in England in terms of uh, gross value added per hour uh, productivity uh, measure. The, the, the lowest in the UK is Powys next door, and we're second lowest in the UK. So we've got some big long term economic challenges that we need to try to address and then all the things that you tell us about every day in terms of there's not enough people uh, to work in the county, there's not enough skilled people to work in the county, there's not necessarily employment plan to help you expand uh, those, those challenges. Again, um, we've heard it before, but there's a huge number of really great things happening in Herringfordshire. What we don't necessarily have is that overarching kind of plan that says how do they all connect together and how do they all work together, but fantastic facilities like this, the Enterprise Zone that Mark's uh, done a great job of uh, developing our old class studios. Cyber security centres, the uh, cabinet very kindly approved last week uh, some investment plans for each of the market towns that Christian helped, uh, helped write, showing how we'll uh, kind of set out how we'll to develop each of the market towns as well as Herringford. The, the, the town investment plan went for Herringford as well, a £22 million is already been skewed from government. How we make all of those individual things work better for us in that strategy. Um, so, in terms of kind of now, looking to take this. Forward, what we hope to do is kind of create yeah. a longer term uh, vision and then a series of plans below that that will get into the detail around how we're going to fund it, what are the actions that we need to do, what are the things specifically we need to do to, to realise that vision, uh, but recognising that vision, the vision will, will also modify and change and grow over time. And don't, don't be foreseeing the pandemic and the impact that that's uh, had, uh, and therefore um, uh, you know, things will change, but we know how we need to adapt with it. Uh, again, you've seen this slide around some of the themes that we want to go around, and I'll touch on in a minute as well. But we need to then link that back to the look to leveling on white paper and the 12 missions. We come across the 12 missions that government has set out some of the priorities that it sees for the country in terms of uh, leveling up the economy or leveling up society. Um, and we need to make sure that we're responsive and we're aligned uh, to that. But uh, these are also some key things that we'll need to think about. And then, in terms of taking forward that process now, uh, we, we've already kind of asked for any evidence that you want to provide with the information that you've got. Uh, uh, any information that you've got that you uh, want to send us through. Um, we, uh, we will build an evidence base to analyse 
and then the process really is alongside the work with them and activities around engaging with you, hearing about the barriers, the opportunities, how we address those, how we got the panel item and back down to you again, and then really aiming uh, in terms of timing uh, to kind of work to draft the panel over the summer um, and then uh, have that plan kind of in place towards the end of the annual year and then to take it through our cabinet processes to start of next year. Um, Good questions that have been asked when we've done this presentation. Really, are we rushing into some of these things too quickly? Is the timing right to get them right? And obviously, we, we want to get them right. We need to set time to get them right. Uh, but equally, we don't want to drag on too long. Even though we've been missing the opportunities that we've got to, uh, to access public, uh, public funding, uh, but also uh, you know, some of the frustration uh, that is in the room that was mentioned last night. The business board about we keep having plans, but we don't implement them. So we need to get the planning right now, and then you know, get on to do something. Um, I'll just briefly touch on uh, and let me go uh, before we get into the question and answer uh, uh, session. So since we met in September, we went around the market towns, government launched in February the learning of white paper. Um, probably haven't read it, it's about 300 pages uh, long. So it's quite a happy summary, but it's uh, not that exciting. Uh, you know, happy to get to sleep at night. Um, the key thing really in there was, uh, it was two or three things. There was the missions that will now become enshrined in law. So the 12 missions that talk about not only economic growth and skills, but talk about well-being and health and community and how, uh, and how all of those things need to kind of work together uh, going forward. And the chances are that every time now government releases a fund for, uh, for us to access, to apply for, that it will be underneath one of those 12 missions. So we need to be able to demonstrate we want to access them and how we're delivering the national missions. Uh, there was also some things in the white paper around devolution uh, and opportunities for every area of the country should they wish to to pursue the devolution to be like the West Group, like the combined authorities uh, uh, um, uh, by 2030. Uh, so that's obviously something that we might want to consider as, a, as an area, but not something that we could train. <laughs> and then the other thing that was announced around the same time as the white paper came out was that each county in England will get some new money called the UK Share Prosperity Fund. Uh, this replaces the money that's come from Europe uh, in the past, some of the money that's come to the local enterprise uh, partnership. But to access that money, we don't know how much it would be per year. We need to develop a plan. Uh, it's called the UK Share Prosperity Investment Plan. Uh, a bit like a number of people in this room have been developing the town investment plan for Hereford. It's a similar principle of what kind of plan do we need for the county that says how we'll support uh, community in place, uh, supporting local business growth, and, and addressing some of those. Skills, uh, uh, issues. Um, so, so as we're developing that economic strategy, we need to be doing the analysis around where we want to spend this money from government and writing that plan uh, over the summer that we look to address some of those things. And again, we very much want to do that with you. So we need to hear from you about what the issue challenges are, and then we need to write the plan that will spend that money wisely. Uh, in, uh, and then finally, just in terms of levelling up, it's um, so slightly confusing. So there's a levelling up white paper, which is the kind of the policy or strategy. There's then the levelling up fund, which is a kind of a large capital uh, fund to, to, to support things uh, before mentioned earlier about regeneration and support uh, for, for local areas, but also uh, transport funding potentially. Uh, government announced uh, with the uh, Spring Widget statement that they were opening the next round to application. Um, and the really good news is that Hereford's now, Hereford has now been identified as a priority one rather than priority two area. What that means is that we'll have greater priority when government considers with these. So as we put applications in, we're going to proceed to be an area that needs to be invested more in some of the other areas of the country and therefore should have a better chance of accessing, uh, accessing that. And the downside is, there's always a slight downside, unfortunately, is that we need to put forward bids that are very well worked up uh, by the start of July, and they need to be projects that can start on site, so you know, well advanced in terms of planning and design by the end of March 2023. <coughs> so that does narrow down the options for what we're able to kind of put forward uh, at this stage, and we've worked with really more projects we might be able to support through that, but it would potentially help us unlock some of the long-standing things that came out of the market town investment plan to let us know. Farm side around Ross, or how we can invest in some of the transport infrastructure and, and some of the things that uh, David's been uh, talking about. And now, we really just want to kind of open up for, doesn't necessarily have to be questions in relation, relation to what we've uh, covered, but very, very happy to cover uh, those but, uh, and, and or anything else that you wanted uh, to raise. So, if you wouldn't mind, uh, again, if you've got a question, and then I'll um, pass it on to um, the relevant person. Yeah, that's all right. 
Has anyone got a question they would like to win? No. Like yes. I'm not going to say that um, MIT is actually happening. Next door, you've got CAT, it's a percent of the advanced temperature. That is going to be good in September. That's a decay of 60 students. You have got the R coverage, also expected. You have got industry expected. We've just released nine factories of priority space. We've already sold all around six large deposits and instructor coins. The activity down here, which has been calculated, is going to expand more. Last night, I was with an old lady on the old bridge, Twenty past four. Still there at quarter to six. No efforts to get there. No basic control. Two nurses came, one from intensive care, one from basically from the A and E. They actually saved the situation because we could, and they did, and we put a high plan taxi there with the seven weeks taken to. It is a problem. And the thing is that. I was there the other day. 19th of January 1967. It's still the new bridge. And that, as you well know, is going to be work that's going to actually close the decent cars. So, what I'm saying, we have got a shoulder in A49 to the A46. That has been closed since 1949. Go down to Africa Bay, the Welsh have brought it right up to Africa Bay, hundreds of millions of pounds. We haven't actually done a lot of That is one of the things to do. And the other thing is, we need another little bus. The council uh, sent a letter in 2012 requesting a bridge from site here to the top of it's the shortest way. There have been plans of possible. It was there, but it's another critical site. So the city accepts it is doing well. The city has got the potential. Infrastructure is something that we haven't really had. What you said today, if you get it done, if you can get the plan done within a year, if you can get some of the projects underway. Then the city will start to really challenge. Yeah, okay. Thank you, sir. Um, I see all the terms not so much the problem, but it's an opportunity for us to become investments. You're right, the infrastructure has to support that. And we have to be a bit concerned about where the infrastructure is there. The last thing we need to do is try and hold. So the great thing about the conversation I had last week with the National Park Office is that having talked to them about the process I want to go through, which is great, I will so visit more. It's not doing these, so it's just academic exercises, but actually delivering. They're going to say to me, they're actually up with that because, and that they want to create a working process to really make a change to our highway network. They wouldn't give me a date when this work has to start, believe me, I'm pressed. And they would, because they're still within the servant. But I have experience of similar structures in London. But if someone's built 1966 of concrete, it's going to be worked fairly soon. It's going to be nearly as it's like, it's designed by the time. So that requirement for official process is absolutely critical. But we have to be realistic also about getting funding. It's creating massive building projects that cost billions and billions of pounds. While they look amazing, they won't get delivered. So, my responsibility to build the tools, houses to manage what we come up with is affordable, they can actually have a good time, but actually look at some of the process we've got. Maybe go to the West Bank and say, what can we do as an interim measure to existing users to give them a bit more capacity just in case the worst happens? 
you know, and there are actually industrial spaces that didn't last. Maybe if there were a few jobs that last, people would be coming up at 49 working in Hereford. Of course, it's having loads of houses to build, it's just going to be a commuter town, and that doesn't seem to fit in with the green. There are, there's no space for those people. This is the need for the town. And, and that's why you know, we all recognize that one of the solutions. 20 years, years. Sorry, no, it is a big thing. The demand for Ross is probably far greater than the demand for the demand. It's well, so the site that we've used today is one is, is the first kind of big hectares because it's the 76 acres across the, the wider site of the old uh, and we're looking at we're looking at how we base uh base that but there's a there's a, there's a strong commitment that um and perhaps Jan's perhaps just might want to, 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 to chip in as well, but a strong commitment to looking at this as a really key one site for the county, not just as it was, and how we might bring that forward. Uh, if we get the government uh, we the members to do that, we'll be putting them to do that and being on site within this next financial year. That's the uh, answer we want. Jim Brock Roderick needs the support of the MPP. So, if you guys want to come to talk about Jesse Norris, yeah, so the, the number of women requires kind of a, a letter of support that we can put them in the fact they get out, they get out uh, almost a kind of a, a joke at that, so it's the one that we would like to have the budget that uh, the work of the EU guidance. Uh, but we will look at the usual. Uh, here, and 
Mr. Leonardo, say a long term outcome that we're selling off in the sense that we have our things made to work and we can bring forward the task and that balance between long term benefits as well as kind of short term Can I just comment that, you know, thank you for organising events like today and, and so coming forward. But having lived in Herefordshire all my life, all I will tell you recently is that the council is nothing but a talking job and we see nothing actually happening. So please, you've heard lots about how you're going to consult more, you're going to talk more, but isn't it time to roll our sleeves up and get something done? And if the council won't do it, I absolutely agree. Set it off and let private enterprise do it and let's drive this county forward. I'm sorry, but the council is sitting on its hands and holding Herefordshire back. And that's not a very complimentary thing to say about our council, is it? Oh, it's not. I'm not sure if we can do as well. Come down to Ross, then. Yeah, I've been down with the wrong two weeks ago. Well, we hate talking about it. Could we no, do no, something? No, I came down with the wrong two weeks ago. I went to the guy and check. We've had problems in terms of, you know, the, the role that they have in the local community. Here. And then we went to meet with three thousand three councillors. Um, Ross and went through 106 only, which has been set aside for Ross. We'll be sure they are in progress with that. How do we do the little schemes with the complementarity with other agencies so we get more out of that money? So we are in Ross, we are talking about Ross, maybe not as much as we should be, or about as much as you want to be, but we are in Ross. We're going to be in Ross on the 28th of June in terms of the next stage of the program. I would expect us a really good turnout because I would want to be talking more about what will follow, about what will six to eight weeks, about what will work well together, and then hearing what people want to do. We are there, we are doing something. Have we seen as much as we have? Your job is to hold us to account for making the deal. So if you're going to be there on the 28th of June, let's have a more detailed conversation about what's happening. We'll so be there, there. But, but, but you know. In your conversation now, you use the word, word talking, yeah, eight times. And we do less talking and more getting on with it, and doing it. But we're doing that in talking when we come out and see the people in Ross. How many years have you been talking about model farm? Well, about when you're 20. Oh, yeah, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. signs have been out there. Yeah. 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 That's the enterprise on this one. This is yeah. a yeah. 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 They moved their hedge, they moved their hedge out of the way, so we can all turn it in. Twice when I went to expand my business, because there was nowhere in town. Here we go again. I don't doubt that's, that's a fair comment in terms of, you know, council talking about things frequently and not doing anything. Yes, we were resurrecting those. Want to make them real and deliver. Watch with interest. Good. And hold us to account as well. That's what we're doing here today. <laughs> no, 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 um, but I'm sure you can doubt with the fame of the, the conversation. But it is hugely frustrating to have things that are just not, have not progressed. The road is the biggest example that I've been talking about. It's been right up to the last 30, 40 years. And the recent um, uh, council group have chosen not to do that and dropped the 8465 uh, we see, we've mentioned the road improvements as you go up the Hester Valley Road, you went to Wales, and then the enormous amount of money has been spent there. We go to Worcester, you go on the M15, and there's a new road going in there. But all of them, it's just an example, because the sign has been up there, I, I believe. And you need to realise that your predecessors have told us, as Mr. John said, and nothing happened, and it is enormously. For those of us in the business community who are used to making things happen, I'm just talking again. So, you know, you're, you're going to have a legacy in this county 
you got to make all this step forward. You've got to get a lot of money together and make it be easy. But please, you guys, and I know Ellie talks a lot about the green agenda, and I heard David <coughs> it, it, it contributed a lot to your conversation. That makes us very nervous because we see the focus in trying to save energy. We understand all the things we talk about at COP26. We all get it, but it's not the top priority. It's got to be part of the agenda, but not the top. We need things that require a lot of money, a lot of expertise, a lot of engineering, and the will of the people with you. If I'm still in a <laughs> I don't disagree that we have a congestion problem. I don't disagree that we need roads to transport goods on, supply vehicles to the world that we have. When I come into Hereford, I live 10 miles out. I either cycle all the way in or I drive in and I park outside and I cycle through Hereford. And 80% of the cars that I pass have one person in them. That's why we have a congestion problem. I'm not suggesting that you deliver your goods on a bicycle. I'm suggesting that we do more of what David was talking about, which was enabling to get on bicycles. If you look at the data that was compiled for the transport strategy review, only 7% of traffic in Hereford is trying to get cars to the city. The vast majority of it is people trying to get from one side of the city to another. And the way that we deal with that it's not by building the bypass. Because that will only work for the 7% of traffic, and the road will just fill up with the people from the houses that will be facilitated by that bypass that will then have their own two cars and will drive it into town to the college and the hospital. The way we do it is the sort of sustainable transport initiatives that David is talking about here. Motor chips, walking and cycling, sorting out buses. We hear loads of all most of the government about investment in buses. We don't actually see any money coming through. Right? So what we need to do is change the mindset, because I have to really disagree with the idea that tackling the climate crisis is a diversion and not the main agenda. It has to be absolutely central. And business has to recognise it's not a distraction. It's the way business has to be done with the tool. And it will lead to a better world for all of us if we help kids are trying to get to school to be on the bus hits, to be walking and cycling, to free up the road space, the goods delivery, and the people with disabilities who do actually need to go out and drive the car. Just, I mean, you, you actually said it, and that goes to what you think there was an awful lot of road capacity at the moment being lost to vehicles that actually need this transport strategy and how we can give them a choice somewhere else so with vehicles not just cars that need to use it use it and use it for a long time so that those that then want to cycle feel safe with it feel safe with it so there's conversation to have with you about okay i'll clear all this capacity on the roads you need to get stuff in and out what type of data you do so that these vehicles are in danger of kids moms who said yep we know my hands up with the people in their cars Yeah, it's achievable though, because it's very dispersed rural economy and everybody 
things that come in into the city and they use their vehicle to do that without there being a congestion charge or something like that. How do you actually stop the people with their single use vehicle coming into the city? There are various ways, and not all of them might be possible. Uh, I don't believe in congestion charges. I stood in Chicago Square, congestion charge on 14, basically to solve the problem in London. I do in Chicago Square. I don't believe in the main charge for people who are going to reduce their extra wealth to drive from the city to the front. Fundamentally, that's why we need it. However, if you, if you have a viable choice of you know, Oxford was done at various other places where you can break apart from the strategy where the people can say, okay, I'm in a rural situation, I need to drive a certain distance to the city. Do I need to go all the way to my club or my work? Possibly not. But if they can make that choice, if we can get a significant percentage of business users to change their choice in terms of how they actually get to their club, the capacity for things like delivery is never going to be increased. But we need to make those things, not just a little parking place in the field where they get rid of the whole. I don't feel safe cycling. Now, I, I can't understand where the point of these buses are going to have to take them to town. There is, a, there is a whole thing that needs to go along with that. It's sort of a new choice for people that are actually. I've now seen that. I've been sitting in this traffic for nine or 15 minutes, and I've seen them cycle through bus from five times. What are they doing? That comes from a conscious. So it is possible. And it is possible to act relatively quickly, but it does mean a mindset change. Trust me, it is possible to do that. And those that need to come in, we are still going to bring vehicles into the town centre, but it's, you know, so many car parks need to be amalgamated into one. So we're not saying nobody can drive in, but those that actually need to come in, we talk to the hospitals. I have a story about, you know, someone who was running. That nurses and doctors need. I want to give them the capacity that I've heard to get in safely, to be out of work, and to get up, get home to their families on time. But for those who don't need to take it, just make another choice. We'll make sure we give you the infrastructure that allows you to do it and get to work just as fast, get back to your car and house first, and go back to your room and get to the next week. If you're in the city, do not get into your car at all. Take another choice. You've got a big challenge. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just a second, Bill. Thanks. We've been invited to speak, mate. Can I please explore this 7% figure, which has been at the heart of the arguments I've heard on, on the road structure? If you go to the Highways England website, it's a while since I did it, but I think I can remember the numbers accurately enough. Go to the Highways England website and you can search the traffic flow on the A49, and they actually give you the opportunity between the Brecon Road and the Abergavenny Road, so it's literally over the bridge. And the figures going back 10 years, mostly exceed 40,000 a day, and I, I sort of, I could see a slightly declining trend, so I, I picked in my mind 40,000 vehicles a day across that bridge. 14,000 of which are trucks, it says on the Highways England website. 7% of 40,000 is 2008. So that says that there's, in your argument, something like 36, 37,000 vehicles are not going through the city. No, that's, um, those two sets of figures are compatible. I haven't got the numbers in my head, but uh, let's say roughly 50% of journeys are just within the city. 40% of journeys are from outside the city to a place in the city. 7% are going around the city. Now, those coming into and out of the city, for example, the car that's lorries, they're not going to be helped by a bypass because they have to come into the city. So that explains why there's that percentage of the that. So you say you do believe that it's 30 odd thousand vehicles that are not going through the city? They're going okay. somewhere else. I'm going on the basis of the figures that were in the transport strategy with you, which is 400 pages of documentation compiled by WSP based on national data and standard highway requirements. That's the data there. Only 7% of journeys are bypassing the city. The rest are within the city or 
is going into the city from somewhere outside. So 30,000 must be going somewhere in the city. Then. Yes, and the bypass will do okay. nothing for them. So the only way to solve that congestion of people moving differently mm -hmm. within the city. Bicycles need bridges. You know, if you're going to cross the river, it's better have a bicycle, but a bicycle, whether you walk or whatever, you need a bridge. So you need an eastern crossing to start with, and wherever you want to go. But we need at least two bridges in the to be successful. We need to make sure you connect with the 41 OP. That's that railway street, that railway bridge. So that's the other things to look at, but we need bridges because bicycles have the top one. Thank you. We're to have a time to see how the questions. It was It's So, at some point, you need to work out why you're really getting good data from the right people. Because if you ask Joe Brooks, the difference. The local plan objectives and spatial strategy on the table, they, they won't know they'll be picked on one or go right to them on the wrong one. So, if you're a parish council like me, business owner, and a resident, you, you might have to fill in those three, those three elements in six times. It's too much of the high volume of the information you guys are going to get if you want how to run the reports directly. You might not expect it. But it is a lot. Environmental building science of 106 pages. That's older than the NPPF ones for the first time. As a plea, there's not many people I'm interested it's just too much. And then the other observation is take it for positive. And there are loads of people by the sector happy to invest in this county to move things forward and get things done. But I think we do the real bit. We feel a little bit restricted when we can't do it because. Whoever it might be, the mechanism or the enabling element of it doesn't exist. So you guys don't have to do it on your own. You just have to kind of create the environment for us to do it. There are people like me and Jeff who have lived up here our entire lives. We're not going to move anywhere else. And we'd like to do something productive, positive, and forward thinking. It's so hard. I waited 12 weeks to get a welfare unit. My offices is for people to have a shower so they can bike to work. Um, that's crazy, guys. From the industrial side, you won't know that you're not asking for any money, but for grant, you just want to put a shower in or to come to work at night. So don't forget the point where those people here. Just to respond to that, I mean, Patsy is great. That's one.
Thank you very much for this talk. So, that's it. Thank you very much.